Studying Antarctica is important because it could help researchers answer many questions. The southernmost continent on Earth is made up of an icy land surrounded by water. Very little snow falls on Antarctica, making it the driest continent. Scientists are curious about what lies beneath the ice, how glaciers function, and whether or not the flow of rivers and lakes beneath the ice accelerates the ice sheets. They want to learn what kinds of life may thrive there, and what kind of unique adaptations certain species may have. They require empirical evidence of the effects of global warming and the threats it poses to both people and other species. Not until 1820 was the Antarctic continent discovered. However, several historians have cast doubt on John Davis's claim that he was the first person to set foot there in 1821. The first decades of the 20th century saw two rival groups of explorers racing over the barren Antarctic landscape in an attempt to set foot where no man had gone before. Each expedition had a different leader, the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen and the English naval commander Robert Scott. Eventually, on December 14, 1912, Amundsen's group was declared the winner of the 99-day race to the South Pole. Four weeks later, on January 17, 1913, Scott and his team reached the geographic pole, but none of them survived the journey back. Scott and his remaining two colleagues were discovered by a search party on the ice in their sleeping bags, 11 miles from their last known supply of food and water. In 1914, British explorer Ernest Shackleton, who was born in Ireland, set out to become the first person to complete the roughly 1,800-mile overland journey across Antarctica via the South Pole. Despite overcoming extraordinary odds, Shackleton and his crew of 28 men never made it across the continent. However, all of them returned home safely. Antarctica's plant life consists mostly of mosses, lichen, and algae. Over the past 50 years, seasonal moss coverage on Antarctica has significantly risen, notably on its increasingly warming peninsula. It is predicted by scientists that as the world warms, the chilly continent will become even greener. It may come as a surprise to learn that Antarctica is home to a plethora of animals, despite the region's lack of lush flora and the total absence of amphibians, reptiles, and terrestrial mammals. In the summer, Antarctica's beaches and icy waters are home to teeming colonies of penguins, whales, fish, and crustaceans. The lone emperor penguin male that stays on the continent all winter long to incubate his partner's egg is the sole warm-blooded creature found there. The female penguin leaves the nest for nine weeks at sea before returning to hatch them. None of the native populations survived the Ice Age on the continent. Today, people live in a variety of scientific research stations overseen by more than 20 different nations. These nations include the United States, China, Russia, Japan, France, and Germany. Scientists are not deterred by the southern continent's severe climate or isolation. According to the Norwegian Polar Institute, as many as 4,000 visiting scientists live on the continent at over 70 research stations throughout the summer. During the winter, the population falls to a mere thousand. Scientists were taken aback when they found evidence of a river larger than the Thames running under the Antarctic ice sheet. This new research adds to the growing body of evidence that indicates a vast underwater network of rivers, lakes, including marine ecosystems, that lie beneath the most inaccessible and understudied region of the Earth. Scientists from Imperial College London, the University of Waterloo in Canada, the University of Malaysia Terengganu, and Newcastle University made the discovery. Researchers in a recent study estimated the length and flow rate of this massive river by combining theoretical calculations with geophysical information gathered from aerial radar measurements. According to their findings, it has a length of about 460 kilometers and carries substantial quantities of fresh water under rather high pressure. Professor Martin Siegert, co-author of the study from the Grantham Institute, said, 
When we first discovered lakes beneath the Antarctic ice a couple of decades ago, we thought they were isolated from each other. Now we are starting to understand that there are whole systems down there, interconnected by vast river networks, just as they might be if there weren't thousands of meters on ice on top of them. Melting snow and rain near the surface can seep into crevices in the ice, creating a water source far below the surface. It's like this under Greenland at the North Pole, where there's a lot of melting in the summer. Researchers have concluded that there is probably not a lot of liquid water lurking beneath the Antarctic ice sheets. Melting near the base of the ice sheet, brought on by the natural heat of the Earth and friction, even as ice moves over land, and friction as the ice moves, appears to be the primary driver of the substantial amount of water that does emerge. Even while this is a fascinating find, the Under Ice River could be speeding ice loss as the temperature warms, which would weaken the ice sheet. The existence of the river was also of interest to the researchers because it could affect climate change projections for Antarctica. There is enough ice in the study area to raise global sea levels by 4.3 meters. To what extent and how fast this ice melts depends on how slippery its underside is. According to Professor Siegert, the newly discovered river system may have a significant impact on this procedure. As a result, climate change projections in the area need to account for this river and other ones. From satellite data, they can pinpoint exactly where and how much ice is melting in Antarctica, but they still don't know why. By ignoring the impact of the river systems, scientists may be grossly underestimating the rate at which the system will melt. Dr. Christine Dow, the study's lead author and a researcher at the University of Waterloo, emphasized the importance of understanding the causes of ice loss in order to forecast how the ice will react to future global warming and how much this will raise world sea levels. Before the 1950s, women weren't allowed to join scientific expeditions to Antarctica. There were a handful of trailblazing women who explored Antarctica and its waters before the 1950s, and many more who asked to join the first expeditions but were denied. Some of the first women to set foot in Antarctic waters included pioneers like Louise Seguin and Ingrid Christensen. Christensen broke ground as the first female to step foot in Antarctica proper. In 1935, Caroline Mickelson became the first woman to set foot on Antarctic Island, and in 1947, Jackie Ron and Jenny Darlington made history by being the first women to spend the winter in Antarctica. In 1956, Maria Klenova became the first female scientist to do research in Antarctica. On January 7, 1978, in the Argentine Esperanza base, Silvia Morella de Palma became the first woman to give birth in Antarctica. Her son, Emilio Palma, weighed in at 3.4 kilograms. Until the late 1960s, discrimination and legal restrictions precluded most women from traveling to Antarctica for research purposes. Until 1969, American women were prohibited by Congress from visiting Antarctica. It was commonly assumed that women could not cope with the high temperatures or emergency circumstances, so they were often kept out of these areas. In 1983, Janet Thompson became the first woman to visit Antarctica as part of the British Antarctic Survey. She called the ban on women quite ridiculous segregation. After women were finally granted access to Antarctica, they still faced sexism and harassment. But by the mid-1990s, the inclusion of women into Antarctic society had reached critical mass. As more and more women started working and conducting research in Antarctica, things started to change for them. To ensure that Antarctica is always used for peaceful purposes and does not become the site or object of international controversy, 12 countries with researchers stationed in and around Antarctica reached an agreement in 1959. The Antarctic Peninsula is not a place where huskies are used to pull sleds. After 1994, no exotic animals or plants could be brought to Antarctica. So, to travel around on the ice, most people use motorized vehicles. Antarctica is home to at least two active volcanoes. Tourists still flock to the islands to soak in the water warmed by the volcano, despite the fact that eruptions in 1967 and 1969 destroyed science installations there. 
If you were to throw boiling water into the air in Antarctica, it would evaporate instantly. Some of the particles would become steam, while the rest will rapidly transform into ice crystals. Would you like to go to Antarctica? Please tell us in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please like, subscribe, click the bell notification icon to keep up to date on all the activity on the channel. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.